Father in heaven, thank you for the priceless heritage that you have given to us. Thank you for our ancestors that breathed liberty, that breathed freedom of conscience. Thank you, Father, that Jesus paid the price so that people could have that freedom to choose and to serve you and to die for you. And we're thankful for the men and women through the ages who stood unflinchingly for what was true. We're thankful for our heritage and for those settlers that came across and braved the waters of the Atlantic Ocean to have religious freedom. Father, as we study some of that history today, oh, I pray that you'd burn into our own hearts and into our own minds the desire to carry that torch that will illuminate the path when Jesus comes. In his name we pray. Amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles this afternoon as we get started with uh, This is Behind the Door, Part 18. Behind the Door, Part 18. We're going to be looking in Revelation Chapter 12, and the title of Behind the Door, Part 18 is England's Glorious Heritage. England's Glorious Heritage. Now, that does not mean that England, of course, would be the only one that has a glorious heritage, because I think we could trace and search from different places, different nationalities, different cultures, where the heritage is equally as great. But uh, I just simply chose this one uh, because of some rather familiar historical things that happened and so that we might understand them in light of Bible prophecy. Revelation 12, verses 13 through 16. It says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So up through verse 14 of Revelation chapter 12, we find that the devil persecutes the church, the good woman of Revelation 12. And it says that there would be a particular time period of persecution in verse 14 because it says the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. And the wilderness, of course, is an obscure place. And it says that the woman would be nourished there in the wilderness for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, we know clearly that the time, times, and half a time is the same time period that we find in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. It's the same time period in Daniel 12, verse 7. And then that same period is mentioned five times in the book of Revelation. And that, of course, is the period of 1260 years. So it says that God's church would go into obscurity for a period of 1260 years. Now, verse 15 continues on and says, The serpent, or the devil cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, what is that talking about? Obviously, the devil would seek other resources to try to destroy the church of God. Because through the Dark Ages, there were, of course, as God's people began to come out of the darkness of obscurity and into the light, the devil had to take further advances at destroying the people of God. And we're going to look at, in England, different people who God raised up 
to begin to shed the light of truth on the world. And so it says here that the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood that he might cause her to be carried away. And it says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. As God's people came out of the light of the dark ages, as they came into the light of the morning star of the Reformation, who was that person? Who? No, it wasn't Martin Luther. Who was the morning star? The man who, after Ellen White quotes a historian in Great Controversy, she says, the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. So through from about 538, when the papacy was entrenched in power, up through basically the 1200s, that was the time of papal dominance in the earth. But in the 1300s, God raised up a man in England whose voice would not be silenced. And he was known as the morning star of the Reformation. It was John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe lived in the 1300s or the 14th century. So as Wycliffe preached, and then the Lollards, who were the followers of John Wycliffe, as they preached in the 1300s, the message of righteousness by faith began to spread, not just in England, but into other parts of Europe. And then in the, 14, in the late 1300s, there was a man in the, on the continent of Europe who began to read the writings of John Wycliffe and he was a reformer in a place called Czechoslovakia, and his name was John Huss. And so John Huss preached towards the end of the 1300s and into the early part of the 1400s. But John Huss, of course, was burned at the stake in 1415. But the light of truth began to spread, and it was no longer in obscurity, no longer in hiding. So the message begins to spread. And as John Huss is being burned to the stake, he says, yet 100 years, and God will raise up a voice that will never be silenced. And who was that man who was to come 100 years from the time of John Huss in the early part of the 1500s, but a German monk by the name of Martin Luther. And so... Through Luther, in the early part of the 1500s, the message goes throughout Europe, into Scandinavia, down into Spain, begins to go into Eastern Europe, and the light of truth is running and spreading like wildfire. Well, Revelation 13, verse 15 and 16 <clears throat> says that the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman the earth opened her mouth swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth as the reformers message spread throughout Europe the papacy and the Jesuit order that was created in the early part of the 1540s they weren't about to stand by and watch this go to all of Europe without trying to stop it. So they began to control various kings and to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And the Bible declares that the devil sought to bring in a flood to destroy the church. But it says that the earth helped the woman and opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Well, as a result of persecution, what did a lot of people who were being persecuted, what did they do? They sought for other shores. They sought for a new world where they could go and worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. And so we see many, many thousands of people 
coming across the Atlantic and making their homes in the 13 colonies. Now what I'd like to do for the rest of our time here today is look at specifically in England a few of the major events that transpired after Luther that uh, where we see Protestantism and Jesuitism or Catholicism going head to head with each other. First off, after Martin Luther, of course, nailed the 95 Theses on the door at Wittenberg and the gospel began to spread, there were, of course, in England various people that were studying at the big colleges there like Oxford and Cambridge. And one of those people was a man by the name of William Tyndale. And William Tyndale was a scholar and an a expert in languages. Most historians say that William Tyndale knew at least six or seven different languages. So William Tyndale used this gift that God had given to him, and William Tyndale took the Greek New Testament, the Koine Greek New Testament, and translated it into English. And the thing that made William Tyndale's translation so important and so valuable was that William Tyndale's translation was not as expensive as John Wycliffe's. Because you see, in the days of John Wycliffe, in order for the Bible to be translated, they had to do it by hand. And because they had to do it by hand, the Bible was very, very expensive. And very few people had the Bible. But in the times of William Tyndale in the early 1530s, the Gutenberg Press had already been invented in 1450, 1453, by a German by the name of Johann Gutenberg. So by the time of Tyndale, printing had made it much cheaper for Bibles to be produced. So William Tyndale's Bible was able to spread in English across the English realm. Now, of course, Henry VIII was not fond of the Bible in England, and so William Tyndale had to flee England, and most of his printings were done in Europe. And they were then put into sacks of grain, sent across the English Channel in ships, and then merchants who were loyal to the Reformation, they would open their sacks of grain, and deep down, buried inside, would be the English Bible. So that's how the Bible spread in England. Now, Henry VIII opposed it for most of his life through the Catholic influence in England. Finally, when Henry died in 1547, his only son, by the name of Edward, came to power. And Edward, who was a very young man, was heavily influenced by Protestant reformers and so Protestantism spread in England. But Edward died after only ruling in England for a short six years. And in 1553, the only child of Henry VIII's first wife, a woman by the name of Catherine of Aragon, her only child, a girl by the name of Mary, came into power. Catherine was a devout Roman Catholic, as well as her daughter Mary. So when Mary came into power in 1553, Protestantism took a tumble. And for the next five years, from 1553 to 1558, many hundreds of Protestants were slain in England. In 1558, Mary dies, and that was the beginning of the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth was probably, in my opinion, was probably the greatest leader 
one of, well, I'll say one of the greatest leaders that England ever had. Elizabeth ruled England for 45 years, from 1558 to 1603. Elizabeth was a Protestant, and Elizabeth was the only child of Henry VIII's second wife, and her name was Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth's reign produced some of the greatest English people that this world has ever seen. It was during Elizabeth's Protestant reign that England's greatest seaman lived and prospered, and of course that was Sir Francis Drake. It was during the time of Elizabeth's Protestant reign that England's greatest poet lived, and that was William Shakespeare. It was also during that time of Queen Elizabeth's Protestant reign that one of England's greatest statesmen lived, and his name was Sir Edward Coke. Protestantism produced greatness in England, and that should not surprise us then that throughout Elizabeth's reign of 45 years, that there were at least five, at least five attempts on Elizabeth's life. When all of those five attempts on her life failed from about 1558 to 1585, the Jesuit order got even more tricky, and it was in 1588 that the Spanish ruler by the name of Philip II sent up the coastline of Europe, right there on the Atlantic Ocean, he sent up to battle with England the most powerful navy this world had ever seen. And that, of course, was known as the Spanish Armada. The Spanish Armada was funded by the Catholic Church. I have that statement in a book called The Babington Plot by J.E.C. Shepard. The Spanish Armada had priests Jesuit priests on board their ships to celebrate victory once Elizabeth was slain and England became Catholic again. So the Spanish Armada was the Jesuits' last major assault to try to destroy the Protestant government of Elizabeth. Now thank God that he intervened and the Spanish Armada was destroyed. The Spanish Armada was destroyed by these means. It was The ships were huge. As they came up the coastline to go up towards England, the little island nation, they ran into strong winds, heavy uh, rains, and many of the Spanish Armada ships were crushed along the coastline or crushed by the awful weather. Others of the ships that actually made it into the English Channel, Sir Francis Drake and his seamen, they would go in and out with their smaller, faster ships and they would hurl balls like uh, torches of fire into the large Spanish Armada ships. And they were so big and so bulky, they would have a hard time maneuvering to get out of there. And so they would burn. And the little ships of Sir Francis Drake were able to defeat the Spanish Armada. It was a miracle of God that the Spanish Armada was destroyed. I can honestly say, in light of history, in 1588, that had the Spanish Armada succeeded and been victorious over Queen Elizabeth, there is no question that today, as I talk, I would be speaking Spanish. Because everything that we have as Americans today are as a result of the great Protestant reign of Queen Elizabeth. 
Had the Spanish Armada won, this nation would have been controlled by Catholic Spain and not by Protestant England. Sir Edward Coke, the great English statesman that I just mentioned a moment ago, he stated this in 1605, a few years after Elizabeth's death. And this is taken from a book called The Jesuits by David Mitchell, page 115. Treason was the Jesuits' proprietary thing. The Jesuits set foot in England. They never passed four years without a most pestilent and pernicious treason tending to the subversion of the whole state of England. So Edward Coke saw that every, at least once in every four years, the Jesuits sought to destroy England. A book called A Popular History of Priestcraft by William Howitt, pages 160 and 161, he stated this, with the continual attempt of these pernicious wretches, the Jesuits, against the liberties of England and the life of Elizabeth, every English reader is familiar. The names of Crichton, Garnett, Perry, Cullen, Gerard, and Tesmond successively engaged in the design of assassinating the Protestant queen will forever perpetuate their abhorrence in England. Do you know what Elizabeth did after the Spanish Armada? She began to persecute in England to execute and to drive out of England, guess who? Who do you think she sought to drive out of England after the Spanish Armada? Roman Catholics. That's exactly right, Graham. Elizabeth and her secret service, her secret police, if you will, they began to hunt down in England the Jesuits and Roman Catholics and to execute them or to drive them out of their country. Now, it's very interesting. If you read a history book about this time period, they'll say, oh, Elizabeth was a bad person because she hurt Catholics or Jesuits. But you know what, folks? If you come right down to it, who in their right mind would give religious freedom to somebody who will use it to try to cut your throat? Do you give religious freedom to somebody who's going to turn around and burn you if you give it to them? No, you don't. So that's what happened in England following the Spanish Armada. Elizabeth, as we said, died in 1603. And in 1603, her, her successor was a man who was known as King James VI of Scotland, and he became King James I of England. Now, why is King James so important to us? Can anybody tell me why? That's exactly right, Graham. This King James who came to the throne of England following the death of Queen Elizabeth is the one who is behind the writing and printing of the King James Bible. So the King James that has brought down and has given to us the King James Bible came to power in England in 1603. Now, because he gave us this kind of Bible, do you think he was Catholic or Protestant? Protestant. He was Protestant, obviously. He was Protestant. Now, if the Jesuit order and the Catholic Church sought to kill Queen Elizabeth 
at least a half a dozen times and maybe more during her reign, how do you think they felt about King James? At least just as bad, if not worse. So do you think it's possible that any attempts might be made on his life? Absolutely. If you go over to England today, there is a festival every year on November the 5th. And it's known as, God, let's see, the Guy Fawkes Day. Well, why did England, why do England still honor November 5th every single year? Okay, they burn Guy Fawkes in effigy every year on November the 5th. Let me give you a little hint into something I read this week. And in fact, I, I think I've got it in my notes. At first, every November 5th, they would not burn Guy Fawkes in effigy. They would burn the Pope in effigy. Eventually, it became Guy Fawkes who was burned in effigy. Now, let's analyze. What, who is Guy Fawkes? What did he do? What does he have to do with King James? And why is that day still honored in England? 1605, November 5th, Parliament and King James I were going to be having a session in Parliament. It reconvenes every, every, uh, November. every year it reconvenes. Okay. Okay. So every year in November, the Parliament and the Monarch get together and reconvene and get back into session. Let me just read some things from history. On November 5 of 1605, two years, two years after King James came into power, a plot was discovered to blow up Parliament. At its opening, with a stash of gunpowder stored in the cellars below the House of Lords, the event is closely linked to the name of Guy Fawkes. He was not the leader of the group of conspirators. Instead, Robert Cattisby was acknowledged as the foremost of the Catholic conspirators. King James, who had already escaped assassination attempts in Scotland, declared November 5th a day of national celebration. Guy Fawkes Day is still celebrated today, although the symbolic figure initially burned was the Pope rather than Guy Fawkes. Where did you get that quote from? That was taken, Graham. That quote was taken from an internet site on history. It's uh, www.bbc.co, the British Broadcasting Company. They never talk exactly the story. They never knew that thing you just said. Okay. Okay. Um, Guy Fawkes was the one who was caught under the House of Lords with 36 barrels of gunpowder. So Guy Fawkes was the one who was commissioned by Robert Cattisby and the other Catholic conspirators. He was the one who was to ignite the 36 barrels of gunpowder. They say he had the thing, he had the, the lighted thing already in his hand at the party. Okay. Then it was pretty close. It was very close, Graham. Okay. 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 So they were 
taking it from the barges that were going down the River Thames, putting it in there at night. They had 36 barrels of gunpowder. Guy Fawkes was caught, and two leading Jesuits in England, amongst others, were involved in the conspiracy, and two leading Jesuits in England were executed. A little, a few notes about Guy Fawkes. He was surrounded in his growing up years by many Catholics during his school days who were later involved in the gunpowder plot. He converted to Roman Catholicism. He worked in the, the house of the Viscount Montague. He was an adult. As an adult, he enlisted in the Spanish army. Guy Fawkes was in correspondence with the Spanish court, which was Roman Catholic. But along with several conspirators, he was given the opportunity to rise up and dispose of King James I. And of course, the idea was to explode the gunpowder during the opening of Parliament on February, or November 5th, 1605 when King James and the Protestant Parliament would all be present. Now, as Graham brought out, Guy Fawkes was about to ignite the 36 barrels, King James, the Protestant leader of England, and all of the Protestant Parliament would have been blown to smithereens. That would have caused insurrection, chaos, and the possibility of an overthrow of, and a takeover by some Catholic peoples who wanted to overthrow Protestant England. The only reason he was caught in the Somerville is because Guy Falk had a cousin that he loved, and he was going to be remembered for harming him, I believe. And he was going to be there. And he didn't want him to get blown up too, so he said, if I were you, I wouldn't go to the Ottoman Empire. Okay. He was, uh, Okay, I want to get that. The, the reason that Guy Fawkes was caught, Graham has just shared, and of course Graham is from England and learned this growing up, that uh, Guy Fawkes had a relative that was in Parliament and he warned his uh, cousin or his relative not to go to Parliament on that day. And so that got everybody thinking and so they began to search high and low to see why he was not supposed to go, and then, of course, the gunpowder was found. Now, if we were living, if Guy Fawkes was living in 20th or 21st century America, what would we call his attempted act in blowing up Parliament? What would we call that? Terrorism. We'd call that terrorism. It's exactly what we'd call it is terrorism. And who was behind this terrorism act of 1605? It was the papacy and the Jesuit order. So terrorism had its origins in Vatican City, and that's where it remains today. Now, King James, because they could not blow him up, finally the King James Bible came out right around 1610, and from that time on, from 1610 on, there has been one attempt after another to destroy this great masterpiece that King James has given to this world in the King James Bible. Next month on Behind the Door, Part 19, we're going to look at the attempts by the Jesuit order to destroy the King James Bible. King James lived till 1625. And in, on that year of his death in 1625, Charles, his son, Charles I, came into power. And lo and behold, shortly after coming to the throne in 1625, King Charles I married a Roman Catholic French princess 
by the name of Henrietta Maria. Now, Henrietta Maria, as a devout Roman Catholic, had a tremendous influence on her husband. And so during the reign of King Charles, we find some very interesting things happening in England. If you look at the time frame, King James, 1603-1625, then King Charles, 1625-1649, to when he was executed, it was right in that time frame that we have a lot of people coming to America, don't we? Lots and lots of people started coming to the United, not the United States, but they started coming to the New World. Why did people come during the reign of King James? Well, some people came during his reign because of economic reasons. They wanted to get rich over here in this new world where they could explore and maybe get a lot of wealth. Some people came to the United I keep wanting to say the United States, to the new world during King James's reign was because King James believed that he ruled by divine right. Now, we've talked about divine right before. What that simply meant was is King James believed that God had given to him the right to rule. And so nobody could oppose King James. As a result, King James at times was oppressive. And so many people left England even during King James' rule to come to the new world. King Charles I also believed in divine right. He believed that he was above the law and answerable only to God. Unfortunately, King Charles's God was the man who sat in St. Peter's chair as a Roman Catholic. During King Charles I's rule, in 1629, he abolished Parliament, who were Protestant. And for the next 11 years, Charles I ruled England with an iron hand. Things came to a head during King Charles I's reign when his wife encouraged him to arrest some of the members of Parliament who refused to agree with him. At that point, in around 1640, there was civil war that took place in England. And the man who came to fight for the Protestants, the Puritan Protestants, was a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell was the man who squared off against Charles I, and it was Oliver Cromwell who brought to an end the reign of Charles in England. Now, a few other statements. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, concerning Charles I. It says, Charles' marriage to the devoutly Catholic French princess further incensed the increasingly Protestant Puritan nobility. Her Catholic friends flooded into the royal court. She was a meddlesome woman who put her wants and those of her friends above the needs of England. So this Roman Catholic princess had tremendous influence over England for many, many years. The Britannic Encyclopedia Britannica goes on, Charles foolishly tried to arrest five members of Parliament on the advice of his wife, which brought matters to a head. The struggle for supremacy led to civil war. So Charles I's wife, Henrietta Maria, a Catholic princess, encouraged Charles I to push for absolute control in England. And that's what led to a civil war. The civil war started right around 1640 and continued on. 
more or less until 1649 when Charles I was executed. Now we mentioned something about Oliver Cromwell and I want to take a look at a few things that have to do with him in light of our Protestant Puritan heritage. From the internet on different documents that I think I could find in many, many places, this is what I found about Oliver Cromwell. As a Puritan and as a Protestant, Oliver Cromwell found himself standing firmly with the opposition to Charles I. The Puritans were zealous Protestants. They led the movement, especially in the period of 1640 to 1642, against Catholicism. They were against images. They were not interested in building churches and regarded the importance of the beliefs and behavior of the inner man, not outward observances. The Puritans feared popery and during the first quarter of the century were forming a large percentage of the English people immigrating to New England. So Oliver Cromwell feared the rise of Catholicism in England. In a book by J.T. Headley called The Life of Oliver Cromwell, pages 61 and 62, we find these words. Oliver Cromwell said, Men, I want men who will bring some conscience to what they do. And I promise you they shall not be beaten. Cromwell thus got around him a group of men who scorned idleness and pleasure and who submitted cheerfully to his rigid discipline. They bore privations and toils without a murmur. They slept says Cromwell slept beside them on the cold earth and shared their hardships. Fighting under the protection of God and for God and religion, they would rush into battle as a banquet and embrace death with rapture. And this body of a thousand men was never beaten. So Oliver Cromwell was a man of strong discipline. He was a man who opposed Catholicism and feared the rise of popery through Charles I in England. Oliver Cromwell was hated by the Jesuit order, and so we read again in the book Life of Cromwell, page 421, that there were 160 men selected from his different regiments, divided into eight groups who were his bodyguards. 160 men guarded Oliver Cromwell at all times. Ten of whom were always on duty about his person. On these he could rely, and unflinching and bold must be the man, and quick the assassin's knife that could reach him. Oliver Cromwell died a natural death. He died a natural death. It's interesting, though. Oliver Cromwell had many children, and his favorite daughter, known as Lady Claypole, she died of poisoning. She was poisoned to death. In the book, again, by J.T. Headley called Life of Cromwell, pages 422 and 423, it says the Lady Claypole, his favorite daughter, was taken sick with a fatal and most painful disease. Her convulsions and cries of distress tore his heartstrings asunder and shook that strong and affectionate nature to its foundations. His kingdom, his power, the commonwealth were all forgotten as for 14 days he bent over his beloved child. So Lady Claypole was poisoned by the Jesuits in order to get back at Protestant protector Oliver Cromwell. This will give us another window into Cromwell's life. This is talking about the Waldenses who we all know to have been very, very faithful Christians during the Dark Ages. 
It says this from the same book, pages 393 through 397. It says, Six Catholic regiments had been appointed to drive the Vaudois, which is another word for the Waldenses, had been appointed to drive the Vaudois from their homes in the middle of winter. The cruelties, the inhuman barbarity that marked the proceedings against the poor Protestants are well known. Villages were burned to the ground, men were hewn in pieces, children's brains dashed out against the rocks, 150 females were beheaded, their heads were used in a game of bowls. When the news reached Oliver Cromwell, he burst into tears. These were the saints of God who had suffered, and all his compassion roused within him. On that day, he was to sign a treaty with France, but he immediately refused, declaring that negotiations would proceed no further until Louis XIV and his Jesuit confessor and Cardinal Mazarin, the prime minister, would pledge themselves to help him in saving the Vaudois Protestants. So Cromwell said, I will sign no treaty with anyone who will support the terroristic attacks on the Waldenses. And then it goes on, a day of fasting and humiliation was appointed. A collection was taken. A contribution, the contribution amounted to over 37 British pounds. That's a lot of money. Showing how deeply Protestant England was stirred by the persecution of the Piedmontese Christians. It is said that Cromwell replied to some obstacles that were mentioned as interfering with his plans, that he would sail ships over the Alps if he had to, but that he would put a stop to the persecution. War with France, nay, with the whole world he would wage, but the persecution of the children of God would cease. Does that give us an idea as to the life and character of Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan Protestant, a defender of the Waldenses, a man who opposed to the end Catholic tyranny? Oliver Cromwell was a great Christian Protestant man, and any historical document that will say otherwise is a rewritten fabrication of history by the Jesuit order. That's what it is. Oliver was the champion of Protestantism. He took pains to let the Pope understand that he knew that he was to be at the bottom of all the persecutions and that if he did not watch out, Oliver Cromwell would see or excuse me, the Pope would see Oliver's ships in the harbor of Savita Vecchia, and he would hear the thunder of Oliver's cannon around the Vatican. In all of his treaties, he made the rights of Protestants an indispensable article. He insisted that English merchants in Portugal should be allowed to worship God in their own way. He compelled France to respect the lives of the Huguenots. The Huguenots called Oliver Cromwell their only hope next to God. Thus the terror of Cromwell's name became everywhere a shield for persecuted Christians. Praise God that he raised up this mighty Christian man, Oliver Cromwell, and what was it that made Oliver Cromwell the great Christian, Protestant, Puritan, defender of God's people, and one who would go after the enemies of God? What made him the man he was? I'll read it to you. It says, on one occasion, while looking at some statues of famous men, 
He turned to a friend of his and said, When my statue is made, make mine kneeling. Make mine kneeling. So make my statue kneeling. Because he said, For thus I came to glory. So Oliver Cromwell, this great Protestant Puritan protector, realized that his power was found in prayer. That's what made him the great Protestant that he was. Now, I was told recently that in Ireland, where many of my descendants have come from, that Oliver Cromwell is not looked on very nicely. It's very interesting in studying about history, and I'm just going to touch it briefly. In the year 1641, October 23rd, 1641, there was one of the worst massacres that have, has ever taken place. It's been known as the Irish Massacre of October 23rd, 1641. Now, the date is significant because October 23rd is the Roman Catholic feast of St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. So the Jesuit order and the Catholic Church took October 23rd of 1641 and it was on that day that began a most violent persecution of Irish Protestant Christians. They say in the massacre that went on for several years that there were over 150,000 people that were killed. And one author I read this week said, it's so interesting that in history, the history that's written today, there seems to be a historical blackout of what really happened October 23rd of 1641. I wonder who caused the blackout. Well... 1641, Oliver Cromwell was involved in a terrible civil war in England with Charles I. And so he did nothing about the massacre in Ireland in 1641. But we find that once the civil war was over in England... Oliver Cromwell turned to Ireland. And he said, this eight years of persecution of Protestants in Ireland is going to stop, and it's going to stop now. Well, the Jesuits said, sorry, we're going to keep right on going. So Oliver Cromwell invaded Ireland in about 1649, right after Charles I was executed in England. And Oliver Cromwell went in, warned a Jesuit Catholic town by the name of Drogheda, where there were about 2,000 men, women, and children in the city or the town. He warned them to stop what they were doing, to stop persecuting Protestants. And they refused. And so Oliver Cromwell and his army went in and every single person in Drogheda was killed. 2,000 people. Now, interestingly enough, if you read history or you go back to encyclopedias and you read Irish history, they will talk about what a barbarian Oliver Cromwell was because he annihilated 2,000 people in Drogheda in 1649. 
The true facts of history are that the Irish Protestants had been persecuted and annihilated for about nine years. And then Cromwell warned the Catholics to cease what they were doing. And when they refused, then it was that Cromwell went in and wiped out the city. It's little wonder why we still hear in the press today that there's trouble in Ireland. No, Ray, Roy, Ray, Roy, Ray, Ray, Ray. What has happened, Ray, is this. As you can see from history, the Jesuits massacred 150,000 Protestants from 1641 to 1649. Ray, the, the Jesuit order and the Catholic Church wanted to obliterate Protestantism from Ireland. That's what they wanted to do. Completely wipe it off the land of Ireland. What has happened since then, Ray, is this. The Protestants who have remained in Ireland, they have not forgotten their history. And they realize if the Catholic Church is allowed to be in the ascendancy and to control Ireland, the Protestants realize they will be killed again. And so to defend themselves, Ray, and to protect what they have, they have resorted to the use of, of weapons. That's what's happened. 